as I said already, I'm uh, more on the apostolic side and we want to make a, uh, a home for the prophetic to feel safe because I feel like some people have been hurt. Some people that have a prophetic gift that wasn't stewarded by the, by the, by the nest where they landed and some of the intercessors might have been labeled as Jezebels and, and got hurt because they were just trying to say what God was saying to them, but the gift wasn't recognized. So can I just speak that over anybody who's here right now that might have felt like there, that there was harsh words spoken over you and that instead of celebrating your gift, go ahead, stand up. Instead of celebrating your gift, you were labeled as somebody who was a troublemaker and it really was that you were needed to be stewarded. Your, your gift needed to be be given shelter and covering over it. And nobody just learns how to do something the first time. There's going to always be mistakes that get made. But if you want to help people grow in the gifts of the Spirit, you've got to be patient. That's where that fathering anointing comes in. Could you stretch your hands to the people that are standing right now? And Lord, we say, heal them right now. You know how when somebody gets bit by a snake, somebody tries to suck that venom out of them? So, Lord, we say suck the venom out right now. Any bitterness that's in their hearts, that's, that's keeping them back from walking in the fullness of the gift, please do this, those of you that are standing. Forgive the person that did that to you right now. Just forgive them and release them. I know it's hard to do it. I know you expected more. I know that they should have handled you in a better way than they did, but just believe they did the best they could with what they knew. There's a lot of flawed people in the world, including in ministry. So just forgive them and say, Lord, I bless them. Ask them. Let there be a revival in their lives. Let them get a download from the Holy Spirit so that other people won't get hurt, but they're not going to hold me back any longer. I'm going to move forward in my gift. I'm tired of feeling tolerated. I'm going to feel celebrated in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be healed. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I put up here. It says why apostles and prophets need each other. All right? It says the whole foundation of the church is built on, on the apostles and the prophets. And, and if you could just go to that next one. Uh, it's got a little bit of wheel here. If you know anything about the Navigators ministry, this is what uh, the founder of the Navigators, a man named Dawson Trotman, he was an evangelist, and he was talking to Navy uh, sailors during World War II out of San Diego that were going into battle, right? So they could have easily lost their lives, and he was a great evangelist. And he said, look, when you get on that ship, now that you've said yes to the Lord, there's a few things that you need to do. One is like a ship's wheel, because they were in the Navy, and an obedience to Christ has to be number one, okay? That's, that's what surrounds you. And then you have to do several things. You have to pray. That's the vertical, right? You've got to read the word. That's your foundation. That's your base. You've got to be in fellowship with other believers, but you also then have to let other people know about Christ. And then what's at the center is the wheelhouse, the control room is at the center. And that's a difficult thing because if you get out of balance in any one of these areas, it'll, it'll be effective, but you'll be missing something. So he said, make sure you find some people, make sure you read the word, witness to other people and pray. And in all things, be obedient and put Christ at the center. All right, now, if we want to compare this to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, a lot of you probably know it. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, okay? And yet these two, apostle and prophet, are brought out as the foundation. Is it more important or not important? I mean, really, this is one of the reasons we keep Jesus washing the feet of Peter up here is to remind us that we don't need ego in the kingdom, right? The, the greatest title is servant, John Wimber used to say, if they invited him to a conference like this, what title should we give you? You want to be, are you Pastor John or Evangelist? Because he was good at both of those. He said, how about Epistle? How about I've, I'm striving to live my life like somebody that looks at me and sees an open epistle read by all men? Woo, boy. There's just not a lot of place for the gifting with ego. All right, so if we want to just lay the five-fold ministry over this, it's pretty easy, right? The teacher would be the one at the bottom there, talking about the word, the prophet uh, and intercessor and worship leader, and those that are trying to break open the heavens above, that would be the top of it there. We know the fellowship piece will be the pastoral part, and then the outreach is easy. That's the evangelism. It's hard, though, to understand why the apostolic would be in the center, but that's going to be my proposition to you, is that we don't try to be like other people. We try to find who God made us to be. 
and, and, and we grow into who he called us to be. It's no different than when we read in the Proverbs that you're to train up that child in the way he or she should go. Different than any other person. Everyone that walks through the door of the church has, its, has their own fingerprint, their own stamp from God on how those, that mix of gifts is going to work in them. And what an apostle does, and what we, the great example we have in the New Testament is Paul, is he looked at people and he saw what God saw and he called it out of them and told them, you're going to rise up into this, who you're going to be, including when he had to correct people, including Peter. <laughs> like, you've slipped. You forgot. You've lost your way. You need to just get back in, into the right alignment. We got delivered from that stuff, and you're bringing them back into it because you won't even eat with these people anymore. It just shows you how hard it is, right? Because Peter was quite the hero in the, in the book of Acts. He wasn't so great in, 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 in the Gospels right, when he denied Jesus. But talk about a transformation of, of a heroic figure in the New Testament willing to die for Christ, yet still got hung up with that old religion. So what the apostle's trying to do, in my opinion here, why we need the prophets is the prophet is going to see into the future. He's going to see things that are hard to describe in today's language. The apostle hears that and says, how do we get there? How do we execute on that vision? How do we ignore all the naysayers? And boy, go back to that first one if you don't mind for a minute, Ray. Because, you know, we got two sides, two hemispheres in the brain, right? And if you had to think about where the religious spirit would be, which one looks like the religious spirit? <laughs> right? The left hemisphere, as important as it is, it makes decisions, but on the right side is where the prophet would be, <laughs> right? Full color, right? Seeing things. Don't always know what I'm seeing, right? So come back down to earth, but keep going if, with your vision. Be grounded in the word, but keep believing God for what you need to see. And, and if the if the apostle doesn't have the visionary, we know what that says in the Bible, that the letter of the law kills how many have been in that experience? But the Spirit of God gives life. So here's the Son. Jesus is the Son. He's the perfect image of that combination of both. He walks up to a woman at the well. I don't think he knew he was going to meet her that morning. And instead of just saying, you know what? The Lord just showed me. My Father just showed me that you are in sin. You're living with somebody who's not your husband and you've had five husbands. You better repent. Today's your lucky day. You met me a religious Christian who's condemning you right now. What did he do? He started talking to her, and she's shocked. Like, why would he talk to me? He's a Jew, and I'm a woman, and I'm a Samaritan. It's because he loved her, and he got, he got into relationship with her first, and then, let's say, he dropped the bomb. She says, I perceive you are a prophet, <laughs> but he didn't do it in a condemning way. I can give you so many more examples of that, but I think we're trying to live with that blending of these two amazing gifts together. Okay, if we could jump two ahead now, right, to that third one. Um, I'm just going quickly here because of my time. Uh, anybody know what scene this movie is from? Yeah, I remember Sully, right? And again, like think about the left and the right hemisphere, the real rigid piece, but then also the piece about uh, I have to think in the moment because if you know anything about this story, it didn't happen far from here, actually. We had been there to pray not long before that whole thing happened. So it was a miracle on the Hudson River. They called it around here. And initially, he was being called a hero. But if you watch the movie, basically he's on trial right here that he's going to lose his pilot's license. And, and the, the insurance company brought them to court and said, you could have made it back to both Teterboro. You could have made it to Teterboro or you could have made it to LaGuardia. And they did their simulations, and you're in the courtroom scene, and it looks like the first time you see it, it's like, man, they got this guy. I can't believe it. He could have made it back. And then he said this great scene. He just leans forward, and he says, can we get serious now? <laughs> so cool. And, and such a, I, I mean, a word in season right now. Our culture is shifting way to that left hemisphere, logical, religious. They're even calling the woke movement a religion. And they're burning people at the stake. And that's, that's what they do when they cancel people. So he leans forward. He says, can we get serious now? And then he starts rallying off the facts. He says, we were at 2,800 feet. We lost both engines. This has never been trained for in the history of, of all aviation. Nobody's ever done this with a full load of 155 people. You've given me no time in your simulation to think about what just happened and that we're all going to die. And he said, how much time did you give me? Well, let me back up. He said, how many times did the pilots get to practice before they landed perfectly at, at those two airlines? And, and the lady kind of sheepishly says, 17. <laughs> 17 times you had to practice. 
I had no time. 208 seconds from the time the birds hit the engine till he was on the water on the Hudson River. If he had looked in the manual, they would have crashed. He had a second nature. He was so tuned into what he had to do, he stopped actually thinking about it, and he acted in the prophetic. That second nature kicked in, and he moved forward. Thank you. And I just lost my 208 seconds here. <laughs> Here's the thing. She'll give me two more seconds. He said, you've neglected the human factor. You ran your simulation, but life is not a simulation. So anybody dealing with a religious spirit here, just don't neglect the human factor and cut people some slack.